Two comedy gals, two comedy gals, Mary Bacay and Sue Ann Weaver. Two comedy gals, bringing you the good, the bad, and me. Oh man, that sucks. Hi, welcome to Two Comedy Gals. I'm Sue Ann Weaver. And I'm Mary Bacay. Yay. It's so exciting that we're going to have Bobby Oliver on for today. I am so thrilled because, you know, she was my first comedy teacher ever. I'm sorry about this hair situation. It's uh, beautiful. What are you talking about? Uh, it's all floppy on the eyes. But <laughs> yeah, I love Bobby so much because she was my first comedy teacher ever. Like she got me in to comedy. Oh, left, right, girl. Oh, shoot. I, I should have put mine on. Oh, uh, well, okay. Anyways. Um, so you know what, before Bobby comes in, which is in a few minutes, yeah. let's pull a card. Uh, I'm just going to shuffle yeah. them. All right, let's pull that energy, energy. Yeah. And oh, these cards yeah. are, <laughs> these cards are made by Victoria Suscom. 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 <laughs> uh, they're, oh, this one just came up right now. They are gorgeous. And I don't know the card, so you have to tell me what this is. Okay, so that is swords. Put uh, the word the uh, the other way, other way, and one more. Nope. Yes, there. Okay, so uh, it looks like the five of swords. Yeah. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Okay. So Fives are always transformational and in uh, fives of swords mean it's like an intellectual transformation and emotional transformation and also one that has to do with a lot of talking. So it's like the perfect card, right? Okay. For this, because uh, Bob um, has been so transformational in lives. And I don't know about you, but like comedy has definitely transformed my life. Big time. It's a lot of pain. It's not all like, Oh, yay. This is so fun. In fact, comedy is generally just makes me cry. <laughs> That's why I love you, because when you get so raw like that, it's um, it's just the best. <laughs> it's, it's like I did that set on Monday with probably one of the most accomplished lineups, if not the most accomplished. Oh. Right. I mean, Dude. I opened for Mike Epps. I got to say he was something, but this was a killer lineup, right? You know what? I was dying. Judy Gold. Oh my God. She was up right before you. And like, I just kept thinking about her after because I was like, oh my God, she's just so, I love her so much. I love her energy. And she was definitely a hundred percent who, who she was, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was like, oh, great. I have to follow that. But, and I thought I had a good set, but then when I listened to it back again, I said, you know, like a thousand times. Oh, I didn't notice. You know what, Mary, you should put headphones on just because Bobby's going to come in. And like, I think that'll just make your sound a little bit clearer or something. And I mean, I checked her sound already. She sounded good, but um, I just wanted you to have a little bit better sound quality, my dear. Let me get that. That's what we get to do. Live shows. I mean, even though it's this is going to be a recording, <laughs> but in a way. You know what's funny and why I love you, though, is like I uh, I appreciate that. Hold on. Let me do this. Yeah, I like it. Um, yeah, your set was great. It was uh, Jackie and Lori's show. So, God, they were good. They're always good. They're they just were amazing, you know, and then I, I felt like, oh, I did okay. And then I listened to it again because I'm like, oh, am I going to buy that tape? No. Oh. <laughs> you know what, Mary? It was really a great set, though, because um, first of all, you followed Judy. You were with the audience. Um, you might have you might feel like you said, you know, I didn't even notice it. I felt like the audience loved it and had a good time. So well, that's that is, good. yeah. Okay. Let's. That's I'm what gonna, matters. Yeah. Okay. Are we going to let Bobby in? Cause I don't want her, you know, getting. No, I told her five 30. Okay. And she was all good. She was putting her makeup on. Okay. So tonight. three more minutes. So I want to hear about your Thursday night show. I'm sorry. I didn't get to attend the something therapy. 
Oh, wait, which one? Which one? Inappropriate which... therapy or something? Oh, the um, a therapy of therapy the absurd. Of the absurd. That was, oh, um, that? you know what? It was a podcast. It was oh. super cool. Um, that was with Stefan Bowman and Dan Ochoa. And then they had Dana Keel on. And, oh, oh, oh my She's God. on my show. Yeah. Uh, uh, and what I'm going to be on too. Yeah. Yes, yeah, with you. And Stacey um, Innes too. And oh, she's cool. great. A young uh, Latina girl. A gorgeous and just very thoughtful like her questions are like okay now mm -hmm. relate like she's like really got in there and like wanted to relate my experience to like the world at large and i just mm -hmm. thought like i liked her so much mm -hmm. it was fun and um oh my god and then i did that show out of the uk out of um oh how was that right because i oh. i bailed on it dude that show was awesome was it oh that's great i loved it i had so much fun i um just you know what i did a little Im not improv exactly but like um some st i planned stuff based on what was happening in the room uh -huh. and it was like i just i went off on like this american tangent i was like so americans great. we're the best and we got ah! faith in the family. <laughs> and i was just oh i would have loved to have seen that oh yeah. my god i've been wanting to do that show you know whenever i go over the uk uh i do comedy in london Cause it's there's so much right and it's a blast oh i'm jealous i gotta circle back and hope he forgives me oh yeah i'm sure because uh, it's at 11 30 you know on a friday it's yeah. not always <laughs> well it's okay for me because mm -hmm. i don't have a job ah! <laughs> yeah so that was good so thanks for setting me up with that too because that was awesome and the oh, audience you. is like cool you know they're european so they're very multicultural like it's all over uh, there's italians and spain spanish and uh people from london i mean austria Did they Really? Did they do it all in English or other languages? Yeah. I just want to watch the time. Okay, we got one more minute. Well, there was one guy who was really fancy and he was just like, you know, he was making jokes about himself being kind of unmemorable because he looks like a regular white guy, you know, but I mean, uh -huh. also speaking three languages, of course, because he's European. He's like, well, oh, I know like, he's not American. Right? Well, that's why I had to do. Uh, that's why I did a little bit on kind of on that being American, because I only speak English myself, you know? Yeah. And he was like, oh, I, I'm European. I only, I get a C because I speak three languages. And I was like, oh, you know what? I was like, you know what I speak? American. Guns. <laughs> yeah. I don't Bobby speak in? three languages, but I got three guns. Yeah, yeah. let's let Bobby in. Okay, cool. And then we'll, we'll let, we'll do it. Uh, we'll do, I guess we'll do Bobby's intro when Bobby gets here. Hey, Bobby. <laughs> yeah. So welcome, 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 Bobby Oliver from Tao Comedy Studio. Yay! Yay! I'm so excited. Oh my so God. great to have you here, We're Bobby. We're so excited too. And you know what? Like last, uh, last time we had a guest, we introduced her all wrong. So I, <laughs> Yeah, I want to wait till you were on to like give your glowing introduction. If you like, because I have a history with you, Bobby. You were my first comedy teacher ever. I adore you, you know, and I've been, you know, working with you ever since for 10 years. Oh my God. Wow. But Bobby is an accomplished author. She's written a book, The Dow Comedy. She is a national headliner. She has more than one special. All right, let's give it up. Did I miss anything? Yeah. Wow, 10 years, huh? Yeah. Can you believe that? Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, in a way, I feel like we've known each other forever. Mm -hmm. um, but, wow. Right, because we both kind of got the Southern thing, you know? Well, Suwan and I started this podcast, actually, just for, it's, it's another, like, lady comic, you know, kind of view of the world. Um, and we started having people on. First, we were just doing them by ourselves. So feel free to jump in anytime, Suwan, if you want. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, we, so yes, we are asking, asking questions we want to know about you. Um, I, I know a little bit, I was, I was watching you the other day, you had your, um, you had, you were on a podcast with, 
Iggy Lovsky and um, Maria de la Ghetto. And yeah, they, and I thought it was so great that you had said that when you saw Brett Butler and Roseanne, I thought that was awesome. Like you could see yourself. Yeah, because like up until then, I mean, I was a huge comedy fan my whole life. Uh -huh. But up until then, I just saw myself as a fan, mm -hmm. you know? And then when I saw um, Roseanne and Brett Butler, um, on the Tonight Show, like I re I I was like, oh, I could do this. Yeah. So yeah, so I'm a big fan of you know role models and having, um, you know, being role models for people and mentors for people and just mm -hmm. so, that, so that everyone feel, knows that they can they have a place here. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I mean that's really cool and that shines through you know in your business and your classes. Well, I like I got started by taking one of your classes, as we all know, to backstop up a lie where I claimed to be studying stand up comedy. And then I quickly went and found a class and it was Bobby Oliver's. And I always believe the universe leads you when you're doing something like that. But Bobby, well, how also, did your husband took my class, I think, right before you. Yeah, he did actually right after me because he can't let right me after, have anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Same. <laughs> No, but how did you get started? Did you have a teacher? Did you take, you know? Um, I, I did take a comedy class, but not until I'd moved to LA and already been doing comedy, you know, on the road and everything. But Sally okay. talked me into it. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. And um, that was in 2001. But I started doing comedy in college when I was 19. And so the first few years, I really only did it at school. Mm -hmm. You know, we would produce these shows, which is how I got together with Chris. Um, we would produce these shows and it would be like sketch, stand up, sketch, stand up. Yeah. Um, and so, because I was under 21, you know, the club punchline wouldn't, you know, was 21 and over and I didn't really know how to get into it. So I just started doing it, you know, because I wanted to do it and I thought it would be fun and I didn't want to wait, you know, two years until I turned 21. And then after, you know, we, those shows went on for years, even after I left and, um, after I graduated and then we moved after we graduated Chris and I we got married and we moved to Athens Georgia mm -hmm. because I didn't know how to start a comedy career yes um and which I think is way easier for people now because they have the yeah. internet and they you know um but I didn't know how to start a comedy career but I knew that Athens Georgia was really supportive of all sorts of artists mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of art and artists and I was like well if there's anywhere you know, around here to start a comedy career. It's Athens, Georgia. And, uh, mm -hmm. and we moved there really just because we used to go there to get drugs every weekend. <laughs> yeah, there's probably a good uh, music scene too. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Amazing music scene, you know, REM, the B-52s. Um, you know, a lot of people lived there for a while, even if they weren't from there. Just a huge, huge music scene. So sure enough, there was comedy going on there at little like, you know, restaurants and bars and um, and I got involved with the UGA comedy group, even though I, I didn't go to school there. Um, I went to LaGrange College. I don't know if y'all know who Kostaki Economopoulos is, mm -mm. but he's a pretty big deal. But anyway, he was part of that group mm. and they welcomed me in and it was, um, you know, and, and then I just started doing, you know, those little one nighters here and there and, um, just have, they were run by, um, a, the, the, this guy named Gary Abdo, who mm -hmm. managing me and he's earth, he was earthquakes manager, you know, earthquake. Yeah. yeah. And Tom Simmons. So we would just, you know, go to on the road. We went on the road, you know, pretty quickly after I moved to Athens, just started, you know, performing in hail gigs yep. uh, up and down the East coast. And, you know, wow. How was that? You were, you were so young and then you know, I guess that's the best thing is when you're young, you don't think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Only when you're young and naive right. would you think, oh, this sounds like fun. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and at first it was fun. You know, at first you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe, you know, that I'm living this life. Mm -hmm. And then after a few years, you're like, oh, God, I'm living this life. You know, it's right. like, can I cuss, by the way, or no? Yeah, yeah. Feel free. Oh, okay. okay. Swear okay. away. I was trying to hold back. <laughs> um yeah like I've never met the two of you before. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> but yeah so I just you know and this was pre like 
you know, laptops and cell phones. And so, you know, I was really alone. You know, yeah. Chris had a real job. I highly recommend having a significant other that has a real job. Right. Yeah. You know, if you don't have one, I mean, if you're going to go on the road, you know, for sure. And, right. um, you know, I did that. I was on the road full time for like seven years. Jeez. I didn't make money. Yeah. Right? If I weren't, yeah, yeah, because, you know, that's what happens. That's what people don't realize, I think, when they're like, oh, I'm going to go on the road. When the road becomes, when you're doing the road so much, you can't have a regular job. Mm -hmm. Then it starts this, unless you're like, a, you know, a trust fund baby or have like a, a mm -hmm. wealthy, you know, somebody making a lot of money at home. Um, once it becomes your job, then you have, you're constantly having to look for more, more gigs and more chances yeah. to be on the road because otherwise you can't eat. Right. You still have your part of the bills back at home, you know? Yeah. Did uh, you so that's when it gets, when it becomes your job, that's when it gets really, you know, really hard because you're gone all the time. I was home a day a week yeah. for like seven years. Did you ever have trouble getting your money like at gigs? Yes. Did you but, get paid up front? How, well, how'd you work that out? You know, here's the deal. But we don't, you know, we don't have a union yeah. and we don't have, and unless you have like a manager that has like a lot of weight behind him like you're just on your own so many times usually what would happen is you would get paid in cash after this after the last show of you know if it was a one night or you'd get paid that night after the show if it's a yeah. week-long gig you get paid after, yeah, it's week. usually in cash yeah uh it was usually in cash now i think it's it's different but um uh you know i've had people not want to give you the whole amount because they're like we didn't have a big crowd tonight and I'm like, that's not my problem. Yeah. My responsibility. And you know, I'm in another state and we didn't have the internet. How am I supposed to promote right. that show? Yeah. So it like literally wasn't my problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had people say, oh, didn't the, didn't the booker tell you like, we're going to mail you a check in a month? No. And I'd be like, I need gas money. Right. To get to the next gig. So mm -hmm. I, I learned really quickly. I mean, luckily I'm from a trailer park. Uh, and my mama was a bitch. So, uh, <laughs> luckily I, you know, I, I was able to stand up for myself, but it's hard. You're like a young girl in your early twenties. Yeah. You know? And, uh, I think I was 23, you know, when I started on the road or 22 and you don't, know, you know, it's hard for you to stand up to these. It's always men. Yeah. You know? so it's almost always <laughs> men. And that's the thing when you're in a comedy condo, it's also always men. You're in there with two other guys who've never yeah. met one in your life. You know, and it's not exactly the cleanest, tidiest situation. No, I always brought my own sheets and my own yeah. pillow and blanket and towels and to a condo because it's just like a, it's just wall to wall jizz. Oh, yeah. Man. You know, it's God just, this, you would, it, it make comedy condos make frat houses look like immaculate palaces. Because <laughs> it'd be like one fork in the kitchen and it would be bent, you know. Man. Um, and yeah, and you were sharing a bathroom, unless you were the headliner, you were sharing a bathroom and it's always a guy. You're always in there with two other guys, two guys, yeah. you know, and one of them was always a little rapey. Yeah. Right. You well, know? that's, that's our other thing. Like we're talking about, this show is talking about women on the road, our experiences as comedians and like those guys that are out there because they there's always the rapey ones. They are, they're still there. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just cause we know about some of their names now doesn't mean they're not, you know, and, and we have to put up with so much more stuff there. We don't have an HR. Right. You know, right. We can't go and complain and say, you know, like I had one gig where the, um, the guy, one of the guys in the condo while we were out at the club passed a note to me from the waitress asking me if I wanted to hook up, you uh -huh. know, um and i'm like i gotta go back to the condo with this guy you know oh. and share a bathroom with this guy i mean not to say that women don't have there are plenty of problematic women oh mm -hmm. yeah that's plenty of problematic women myself <laughs> included um but i mean we're not rapey you know right yeah do you feel like it's different for women now or is it more or less still exactly the same either on the road or in la generally i mean i think it depends on where you are Mm -hmm. um, like I remember once, you know, back in the day, I performed in about 14 states regularly so I could come home a day a week. 
Mm -hmm. um, I've done comedy in like 26 or 27 states, but mostly 14 states regularly. Mm -hmm. And I would get a phone call like right before I walked out the door to drive, you know, 12 hours or whatever to the gig. And they'd be like, yeah, this literally happened to me. Yeah, we, we, we already have another chick. We all want two chicks in one week. In one week. In one week. I'm like, I have a car payment, you yeah. know, that I was expecting. On. So I think, in, you know, I don't do the road anymore, which is why I moved to L.A. to sleep in the same bed every night. Mm -hmm. I only do like if there's like a, you know, like I did a corporate gig in Vegas, you know, yeah. and I get pay a lot of money. It's not very mm -hmm. far. Um, but um, so I don't know what it's like. I mean, the road is probably still shitty. Well, yeah, I've I'm told like, you about in San Antonio just four years ago, uh, they would not book me to open for a woman headliner. They're like, no, nobody wants more than one woman on a show. Right. Oh my God. And it's I'm like, like, look around. You know, that's old fashioned. I told the manager, like, you know, that's old fashioned thinking. Nobody thinks that anymore. And he's like, no, that's what everybody thinks. You don't know. Yeah, we're 50, <laughs> what, 51% of the population? 50 oh my God. Right. Yeah. Who's in the audience? You know, I always say boys yeah, women. control open mics, but women control audiences. Yeah. You know, and if you, if you're only, if you only know how to make, you know, uh, like dudes at open mics laugh, you're not going to, you know, be able to succeed in a real comedy show. Yeah. So, but some women don't like other women comics. That's and you know what? Here's why. Here's my theory. It's the entertainment industrial complex. Mm. So comedy central, you know how your friends and family think the only comedy is comedy central? right the only comedy happening in the world is comedy central yeah and so therefore it must be the best comedy right, right. but we know that in art um and in stand-up specifically the cream doesn't always rise to the top right exactly sure. the There's most a lot of marketable people. thing rises to the top yes and so they are exposed to the inter entertainment industrial complex so they're used to seeing like one type of female comedy mm -hmm. And so when they hear female comic, they're like, they pick, they think that's, you know, that's it. Or maybe a couple of types of female comic. But, but so I think women who don't want to see female comics are just because they haven't been exposed enough to them. Because what's happening is some of the women, some of the women, it's getting better now, that rise to the top are like men's female comics. Right. <laughs> yeah. Men's I've favorite seen female that. Comic. Well, and I don't know if women are more competitive, but I think I've experienced, like when I was working with you, Bobby, and doing your shows, like I never experienced a feeling of being competitive with another woman because you encouraged all of us, men and women, all like as one. But in other shows, I have, you know, I, sometimes I definitely feel jealous of like when only one woman gets the gig. Like, why yeah. did she get it? She's been doing comedy two months, right? I can't help but feel jealous over stuff like that. I don't know. Do you feel like, you know, Well, for women, one thing, we're trying to be competitive. Yeah. Women are trying to be competitive because they don't pay us worth the shit. So yeah. we have to find some man that makes money. And then we we're competing for the man that makes money versus right. being able to have our own, you know, economic opportunities. And so we're trying to be competitive. So when there's 10 dudes in a show and one woman in a show, we say, how'd she get that? Yeah. How'd she get that. But what we, we need to readjust our thinking and be mad that 10 dudes are in a show. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That's what I think is like, what the hell? Like, I'm still seeing lineups with all white. All white guys. guys. All white guys. I know. You know? Yeah. Or like, all straight white guys. Yes. And it, like, I went to go see, support a friend of mine who was in a comedy festival that I'd been in before, but I wasn't in that year. I don't know why I'm giving you so much backstory. Um, <laughs> So I went down to San Diego to watch him in this festival mm -hmm. and uh, there were 22 people on the lineup. There were 20, um, 20 regular people and they'd thrown up two extra people. Not a woman among the 22 wow. people wow. on the lineup or maybe it was 21, but not a woman among them. And nobody even thinks like, huh, I wonder if this looks a little lopsided. Right. Like you have to think that, like, I realized that I had a blind spot because whenever I would see a, a flyer with all dudes, I'd be like, there are no women on this show. And then people of color would be like, there are also no people of color on this show. Yeah, that's true. Or too. there are also no LGBT, you know, or, and I'm like, right. oh, so now I have to look at a lineup and go, am I, you know, am I giving opportunities to, to not just women, 
Yeah. And also woke dudes. You know, yeah. I love I love woke dudes. Yeah. But um, but am I also giving, you know, plenty of opportunities to people of color and you know, people on LGBTQIA plus um people and you know, and you know, we have to keep we need to reward the woke dudes. Yeah. Oh yeah. They that's need true. to get plenty yeah. of work too. Um, good ones out there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that we can incur, you know, so that they don't kind of die away or. Yeah. Well, they need a place, yeah. They need a place to go to. And there's, there's like a bunch of good ones. Yeah. yeah. Like, I yeah. definitely can say that. I mean, I'm married to one of them. Yeah. He's yeah. awesome. And he's like, he yeah. Chris. He's so and Mary too. Mary's also married to like a yes. great guy as well. Yes. Well, how do you, what do you feel like we can do to make it safer for women and and create more opportunities you know i mean it's not so easy i mean it's like it's like we think about this because we this is what we're talking about yeah. we well i think more women running things definitely helps mm -hmm. uh i mean y'all have your you know y'all put up women and mm -hmm. um but here's the thing that irritates me to death when a woman producer just headlines men Right. Are mostly headlines. Men. Ever headlines, men. I get mad at them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I was like, normalize headlining women. You know, yeah. somebody's going to headline that dude. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, that irritates me. But I think the more we do, the more it's going to get better and people are going to gravitate and support. Yeah. You know, what worked like Dow Comedy Studio. We won Best, Pl best of LA, Best Place for Women Comics. Right. You know, people come to our mic and they yeah. spend their entire set talking about how clean the bathroom is yeah. and you know, and how there's free tampons in the bathroom. Like there's, mm -hmm. so, so it's like, I didn't consciously be like, Oh, well, if I put, you know, clean the bathroom, you know, I'm going to try my, I just, I'm a woman. So that's how right. I, I know. I feel like when I go to Dow, like you treat me like a person, like a full hundred percent equal to anyone else, you know, who's there. I have kind of a question I wanted to dig into a little bit deeper, if you don't mind, Bobby. Let me just ask you, okay, when, because I have trouble with this, all right, when you do feel competitive or like jealous with someone, a woman, how do you handle that? What do you, are you like a person who's like, oh, I'm going to be a better person or do you want it? Are you just like, I mean, at first I'm, I feel extreme pettiness. Yeah. Because I'm extremely petty. I am too. That's why I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, that's why Mary and I get along. So we well. love each other because we recognize that. Yeah, we're both petty other. as fuck. <laughs> like if John, if uh, Tom Petty and Lori Petty got together and had a baby, it would be Bobby Petty <laughs> and Mary Petty. <laughs> yeah, and Mary Petty would be both. This one. Um, so yeah, so at first you have that reaction. To, yeah. Like, why did that girl get that? Why is why is she, you know, a headliner, or why is she get that opportunity I wanted or whatever? Yeah. Um, but then you have to be like that. I'm just, this is my issue. You have to recognize this is not an yeah. issue. This is my issue. My issue. You know, yeah. um, and, and Maria Bamford said that Jack, uh, told me that once that Jackie Cation always said, I mean, Jackie Cation said it, but Maria told me she said it. So if this yeah. is a misquote, Maria <laughs> misquoted it. Uh, <laughs> no, she said that, that Jackie's always said, you get what you get. I think Jackie's got a great take on it because I just saw a tweet she posted today. Like, she's like, I'm happy for people who are really doing a bunch of stuff. And then Lori Kilmartin piled on and she's like, no, I want to punch the people who got booked on the A-list and I can't <laughs> wait for quarantine to be over. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think both of those emotions are valid. Yeah. You know, and you just, you feel them at different times. I mean, as long as we don't go punch the person who got it. I really um, struggle I with it. And sometimes, you, go ahead, go ahead. And I always have to be like, yeah, that person does that show a lot. But if I ever reached out to do that show, if I, you know, I'm just like, well, they should have asked me, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, am I put, you know, and like when people get all these writing jobs, like at Conan and all, I've yeah. never submitted a writing packet to any late night show. So how, you know, they did, they right. put in the work on that. So good mm -hmm. for them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, point. there's some chick I don't even like anymore who got a writing job and I'm like, good for her. <laughs> I still don't like her, but good. I for bet her. I know who that is. Too. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> I, still, I, don't, I still don't want to be friends with you anymore, but good, good on yeah. you. You know, try yeah. to make us look good in there. Uh -huh. Yeah, for sure. You know? 
But real, I mean, it's just getting more women and, you know, women, see, here's the thing with women, we're socialized differently. So when we, we realized that when we were, were full up on how far out we were going to book, we would tell uh, everybody who wrote, um, hey, hit us back um, in the middle of next month mm -hmm. and we will, you know, we'll get you booked. And then what we discovered is that men would hit us back on the 15th. Mm -hmm. of that month or the 14th mm -hmm. of that month and women would wait like a week or so like they didn't want to be pushy maybe mm -hmm. and then they would write and we we're like oh we're this show's full of dudes already so we started doing two things one we started giving the exact date to write back to everyone mm -hmm. and two our availabilities go if we we get a certain number of men in this date and when we mm -hmm. reach that number of men we don't offer men that date anymore we mm -hmm. offer them the next week or the following week so that we can be sure we're sliding women in there, even though they weren't as aggressive for a spot. Yeah. Yeah. See, that's so interesting. It's like the guys are just taught to raise their hand first and to stand in and like, just get in there and, and that's all okay. You know? And yeah. then we're, we're taught to be like, I know I was like, I was definitely taught to be passive, you know? Right. And oh, I get called names entitled oh, yeah. pushy aggressive and i'm like hey i'm just asking for spots you know? yeah when that is normal male behavior yeah. that nobody would say boo about it if the guy yeah. wrote and asked again for another spot mm -hmm. um but when a woman does it she's being pushy yeah 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 i um i <laughs> i don't even want to say i talk about it too much but i got into this comedy festival and I, you know, when I got landed in the room, they were kind of like going like, okay, who wants to go next? And then do your little intro it was like, kind of like an intro to the, to the room or whatever. It wasn't mm -hmm. publicized. This was just for the, who was running it. Uh -huh. So I landed in the room and it was kind of quiet. And I was like, Hey, I'll go because it was quiet for yeah. seconds. And then I felt like everyone was like hating on me. Cause then I realized, oh, there are a bunch of other people in here who weren't, who weren't standing up a bunch of other women especially that were just kind of passively like waiting to be called but i just jumped in and then i and i stuck around i didn't like just you know get called and they were like okay yeah go ahead mm -hmm. but um after i went then i stuck around and i felt like i don't know it, maybe maybe i was reading into it but i realized there were a whole bunch of people that were already in there that were just waiting and i just because i thought well, there's, there's a lag. I'm going to just jump in. Right. And they asked who wants to go. They didn't yeah, say, exactly. you know, who got here first or who, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Just a fucking list. If it's you a know problem, what? we're damned if we do and we're damned if we don't. I know. Right. If we don't process the emotion, then we're insincere. And if we process it and go like, Hey, I'm jealous of you. We're irrational. Are, <laughs> fuck off. Yeah. Get away. Yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. 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 around you. It's like, you know, no. honestly, that's why my open mic is women only. Yeah. So that we, we bond in the absence of men. Mm -hmm. So there's nobody in the room to like, to like our, for our, our training to kick in and go, oh, I have to be competitive with the other women. Yes. That is interesting. Bobby. And I think it kind of works well like that, you know, because oh, I know oh, well, so many friends, like even winter, we had winter spears on last week and she and I were like, where did we meet? She's like, I'm pretty sure it was a Dow you know at one of the you know right girl festivals over the years yeah and when you see or like the mic or anything if you see another woman at a mic go over to her oh yeah. for talk sure. to her introduce yeah. yourself give her your contact info yeah you know? well, that's what i do i have a tendency to just be like friendly and be like let's not be weird anymore come yeah. on yeah i mean it's easy to just go talk to the people you know I mean, mm -hmm. that's the thing we all fall into, um, but to go up to women and go, hey, what's up? And hey, there's, this is a good uh, open mic for women. And here's a good show for women. And you should hit up so-and-so. And, you know, so there, there's so many things we can do. We can yeah. start our own shows and mics and rooms, and we can, you know, try to, yeah, let that, that initial feeling of competitiveness will come up, but then try to like, then get past it yeah that's just a trained response 
Yeah. I think it is really important to try and get past that, you know, and uh, I just like, I don't observe that many people acknowledging that as a real feeling and then trying to process it. So but I think I noticed you. Well, and I think denying honest it, about it. Yeah. denying the feeling, you'll never process it. Exactly. Right. And if yeah. it's a friend of mine, I'll say something like, hey, you know, whatever. And, mm -hmm. and get the feeling out because otherwise you're like right. just presenting the person privately right for, you can't you know, do that 10 yeah. years or 12 whatever <laughs> um, but um you know i mean we're human beings i mean right. we're not running for jesus right. <laughs> you know yeah. we're doing the best we can and we have all these extra layers of stuff on top of yeah of, on top of how crazy and, and awful comedy can be mm-hmm have so um in the terrible and crazy have yeah you ever, that's a great segue <laughs> yeah uh, um have you ever had to worry about a guy like you know being too terrible and crazy like any any hell gig i mean it depends on what you mean or <laughs> actually probably no matter what you mean yes yeah <laughs> no matter what level of that you were talking about yes yes you know i've, I've been made to feel uncomfortable but i've made people uncomfortable you know what, when the Me Too movement happened, I had to like take a good hard look at myself and realize I'm grabbing people's butts that probably don't want me to grab them, you know, men Girl. and women. You know, I, I thought, I used to think it was funny to hit on young dudes, like hit on my students or whatever. And I'm like, how uncomfortable must they feel mm. with me joking around with them like that? I mean, and sometimes not joking, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but like, yeah, I had to really check. I keep my hands to myself now. And I try not to, to go for the inappropriate thing that I want to say, you know, you know, um, not, so yeah, yeah it, it's not just men. I mean, we, I, I mean, I know I, I definitely have, um, have had my issues and have, have looked really hard at, at how I, you know, I think I, I think I have people. too. Like I definitely have certainly, you know, uh, probably patted people on the butt that I shouldn't have really Bobby, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> in Texas, you know, before we were thinking about that, because it's a kind of a way to get your own power back, right? Uh, like I'll act in this inappropriate way. Um, yeah, but I didn't think it because yeah. of power, because I was like, well, I, I have no power, you know, I, yeah. but I do have power in a way. Yeah, like, you're the teacher. If I'm the their teacher figure. or if I'm running the show or yeah. I'm the headliner of the show that night or whatever, they do kind of see this, this power dynamic. And I'm older. I think I'm 20. I don't know about you, but I still... Same. I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh, wait, I'm not 20. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. You know, so I've had to really, you know, so it's not just that that men have made me uncomfortable. I've made other people uncomfortable, <laughs> you know, uh, well, I haven't yeah. raped anybody <laughs> right. just for the record. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, I've had situations where, uh, you know, this guy, one of my students, the guy who I would get to walk me to my car at night because I was afraid. Uh, of you know of uh, being out there night one time he was drunk and he he was making a lot of noise in the back of the room at the show and I went up there and I was like you know dude be quiet and he was like you know I'll, I'll shut up if you kiss me Bobby and we were good friends so I was like and he grabbed me stuck his tongue down my throat put his hand like um, in my crotch Ew. like it like this whole thing happened so fast <gasps> and this was the dude that would walk me to my car and then when he was sober another day he apologized to chris oh oh my so God. offensive never to me wow to chris for doing yeah i had a i had a stalker who was not romantically um interested in me but attacked me at a coffee shop at an open mic mm -hmm. um and uh you know, a couple of comics like John Fontaine got up, stood in the way, like protected me. Um, and then the coffee shop did, didn't even call the police. Like they just, you know, they, they just, you know, gave him a coffee because crazy people need caffeine. I guess. Right? You know, yeah. like, I, mean, I think I knew that guy. I think I knew the stalker guy too. And we won't mention him. Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you who it is after. But yeah, he, and I tried to get a restraining order against me. And I couldn't get it because even though I was willing to pay four hundred dollars for it, wow. I couldn't get it because they the coffee shop didn't call the police. Ah, uh, yeah, he was another comic. God. And at first he was like, "Hey, Bobby, it's me. Can I talk to you? It's just me, you know." Because John Fontaine immediately stood up because he knew, yeah. you mm -hmm. know. And I was sitting on the back couch with Sally, 
and um and he was like bobby it's me it's me like i, I would have talked to him if i'd known it was him and then when john like stood up and pushed me you know like tally and i kind of ran to, further to the back and he starts going bobby oliver's a fucking cunt all you people listen to her and she's just a fucking bitch wow. and she's just, you know and i and so, like he physically tried to grab me and john fontaine stopped him from doing it um so what and he knows where i live because i used to have parties at my house mm -hmm. where i would invite all my students over mm -hmm. so he knew where i lived and then somebody later said oh yeah you know i noticed when he would come to your parties like wherever you went his eyes were on you the whole time man like you know and if you'd go upstairs he'd go upstairs and i was like well thanks for telling me that now yeah, exactly. <laughs> after he attacked me so yeah i've had you know i've had problems with i've had a female i've had female stalkers so oh. you know, it's not just a male thing and they either love you or they hate you and it depends on the day but you know i feel like with a male stalker well i mean maybe you felt like you were in danger with a female stalker too but it, it just seems more like it's more dangerous because physically they have more strength you know physically yeah. there's more danger men are 51 percent stronger than women you know and this dude his dad had a restraining order out against him his 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 senior citizen dad because he had punched him in the face wow his dad so i was like if he will punch his daddy in the face he will punch me in the face right and it's not like i can't take a punch to the face i've had many a punch to the face but i'm not <laughs> yeah. i'm not seeking them out <laughs> exactly holy you know? shit. see this is like why i want to talk about this is because we as women have real physical danger to face and if we're on the road, if we're alone out there, especially going to a strange place, you were asking for money, standing in front of someone who has power, who may or may not give it to us. We don't know what's going to happen. And then there's no backup. I mean, sure, there's a cell phone, but, you know, there's. Well, I've called the police many times in L.A. on various things and they never shown up. Right. Not once. So, I mean, here in a local town, like have comedy buddies. You know, yeah. if you live in the same town with somebody, plan to go meet each other at open mics, plan to go to do this together or that together. Um, but when you're on the road, it is a lot harder. Yeah. Um, I stopped reading serial killer books when I was on the road. I'm like, this is too yeah. much. No. <laughs> I carried a gun when I was on the road. Wow. Honestly, yeah. I think that's smart. You never had to use it though, did you? No, but I was willing and it was loaded. I took a, a gun class when I bought it. Mm -hmm. uh, I took a class with a whole bunch of people who probably turned out to be Trump supporters. Um, yeah. uh, in Georgia, I was the only liberal in the class and I kept my fucking mouth shut. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I learned how to shoot. I learned how to work, you know, because you shouldn't just have a gun. Right. Um, but I don't have it anymore. Yeah. But I was I in a different state every week by myself. Yeah. And I think our broke down or. Well, you know, what's important, Bobby, is like you had a plan right so you're like i'm ready and i think that translates to an attitude too of like how you walk you're like i will not be a victim i'm prepared to not be a victim you know although sometimes you still get attacked you can't help it i remember person. yeah you told me the gorilla suit story the what the guy, there was a guy in a gorilla suit who came up on stage oh with my god yes i forgot about that to what this is the answer to your question <laughs> holy shit um I was once, I've been physically attacked on stage three times. Woo. And one time was from a guy, by a guy in a gorilla suit. <laughs> I mean, it was Halloween, so it, it, that was less bizarre. Yeah. But so I was performing in this resort in North Carolina and it was the walls to the comedy club were glass. So that people walking by in the resort could see in there and be oh. like, oh, let's go, you know, so you could see people. So I'm on stage. I was the middle, you know, the MC, the middle and the headliner. Yeah. I was the middle, the feature. And I see this guy in the grill. So, okay. So it's less weird because it's Halloween, but it's worse because he came from a postal worker party. Mm. Right. And at the time, postal workers were known for, I mean, the term going postal came from somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, so um i i'm on stage and i see this guy in a gorilla suit i see him stop turn to me 
I see a light bulb go off above his head. Wow. Um, and then he ran in around the corner into the door. At no time did he pause, uh, pause, uh, <laughs> um, assess the situation. No, he ran in and immediately ran on stage and grabbed me uh. and started literally pawing me with you know grabbing my boobs and, my, and, I, and the, one of the two of the three people who attacked me on stage physically grabbed you know my my boobs and stuff um and like I, you said i'm a you, very young girl in my 20s from a trailer mm -hmm. park in a very small town so um this was at the time when i still thought that the club owners would help me yeah. in some way so i was looking um I was and that and the the manager in the back was like, huh, this place is wild. Oh Anything can happen here. And I'm getting sexually assaulted in front of a room full of people who think it's part of the act. Right, of course. Because why wouldn't it be? Right. In a girls. So actually, I had learned at that point um that if you punch someone in the face, they will go away. Mm -hmm. That's a good All one. right, good. So I All right. Punched him because you know i'd been physically attacked on stage so many times i'd learned I, so i uh the second time i punched the person so that time i punched him in the face and a gorilla i don't know if you know if you've ever been attacked by somebody in a mask but you don't know what's going on with them how they're feeling about attacking you are they kidding are they right. seriously trying to harm you yeah um and and so i punched him really hard and it you know it was a big gorilla face so it hurt my hand very bad mm -hmm. but it must have really hurt him because he like went back and like stumbled back and then like ran out of the room wow and this happened at the beginning of my set Jesus oh. so i had to do 30 more minutes oh. in front of these people who had just seen me being sexually assaulted on stage oh. and oh. and i had to like not cry and not run out of the room and go up to my hotel room. I had to deliver, and they just the whole time are like, <laughs> "Oh my God, Bobby!" Well, really, yeah. Like you said, they thought it was funny. They thought yeah. it was part of the act. They thought I planned it, you know, because why wouldn't it be part of my act? Or even if they didn't think I planned it, they thought it was funny. You know, it wasn't happening to them. But wow. it was horrific. And I've since uh, connected on Facebook with the guy who was like the headliner that night when it happened. Mm -hmm. um, his name's Emmett Furrow. Um, and so, yeah, thanks for reminding me of that, that Mary. Yeah, I was attacked on stage by a guy in a grill. So I know mm -hmm. a woman who was attacked. So she said, you know, she was on stage and this guy goes, uh, I want to eat your pussy. And then leapt toward the stage, toward her. She fell back. He fell on top of her oh on the stage. And then he passed out wow. on top of her. And I was like, oh my God, what did you do? And she said, I said, thank you. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So yeah, yeah, it's definitely. This is like, exactly. Thanks for sharing that. That's so intense. I mean, if you've ever been grabbed inappropriately, which I have, then and and pod and that kind of stuff, it's just not fun. It's horrific, and especially yeah. if helpless. And then you're on stage, and then you got to do your thirty minutes, oh, Bobby. Fuck. And it's not like I got bonus pay, right? <laughs> you know, I didn't get hazard pay. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 I kind of bring that out in people, <laughs> like. Like I get, you know, I don't know what it is about me. I mean, like maybe I do know what it is about me, but I just, people love, you know, but luckily only one guy in a gorilla suit yeah. um, to date. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and two other, uh, two other attacks. So, you know, those count. And they're almost always just too drunk. Mm -hmm. One of them was, um, I was emceeing a, um, a lip sync contest and there was rice all over the floor when i went back up to announce the winner because somebody had thrown part of their act was to throw rice on the um i'm sure it was hilarious <laughs> um, so the this the people who won it was a group of guys and they all went on stage and like picked me up and there was rice on the floor so they're all kind of doing this and we we're all kind of and yeah and it was and that's that's the 
I can't remember what the other time was, but I know that was the second time. Do you think part of that is what gave you the drive to start and successfully run your own comedy business in LA, which I want to give you snaps for that, Bobby. It's a rock city to own a business and you've been around and you're we still just turned here. Dow comedy studio just turned eight. No, oh, okay. just turned seven. We're going to yeah. eight here. Yeah. But here's the thing. Like I didn't plan to open a comedy business in LA, mm -hmm. you know, I, I moved here to, to do comedy and to sleep in the same bed every night. And I had a real job. And then I started teaching comedy and at Pasadena City College. And then they wouldn't let me have much control over the class, like how many people could be in it. And so, so I moved it to the ice house for nine years. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I even left to go um, open, well, at first when I, left I wasn't even planning on opening a school I just wanted to get the fuck away from the ice house mm -hmm. but I left them because they wouldn't book me uh, right I of taught course. comedy there for nine years I bring a show there every week yeah. and it would just be pictures of dudes for the, like the next six months and they would book occasional women but they wouldn't book me yeah and the reason the thing that the straw that broke the camel's back is a, mm -hmm. a friend of mine I knew through my hairdresser who is a real person um had uh, their office christmas party there yeah and they did it because of me they rented out and you have to pay all this money to do that yeah and they asked for me to be one of the comics in the show not to not even the headline. headliner yeah one of the com and they told her i was busy and they never even asked me wow i would have left too and you're helping them make so much money so and you remember mary how much money i was making them i mean i was making you them packed that place over packed it. not just passed it but, but i paid rent for four classes my three comedy classes john fontaine's improv class packed shows um i i you put took ads out and passed in a week of weekly constantly with their logo on it that they didn't have to pay for i was on the cover passing a weekly twice mm. that was free advertising for them i made them so much money and i have a philosophy i refuse to make money for people who are mean to me yeah you and shonda rhymes <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. right, right. <laughs> that's, that's what we have in common so, um, I left there just to get, I was like, no, I don't care if I go bankrupt, yeah. I'm not going right to make another scene. I used to post pictures of their upcoming the next, you know, few months. And, and I would post pictures and said like, uh, too bad. No women do comedy, <laughs> you know, because it was all just, so I left there and I was renting theater asylum and elephant studios mm -hmm. for like a month, no intention of opening my own comedy school, none. Mm -hmm. And then a friend of mine called me um, and said, hey, there's a sign on this building across the street from, from us. And, uh, you know, come look. And so I went and looked at it. This was the, our old location mm -hmm. on Beverly Boulevard, which was just one room in a building that had a communal bathroom. And, and I was just going to teach my classes there. So within a month of me leaving not even knowing where i was going to go just being like i have my pride i'm not going to put up with this and just leaving dow comedy studio fell into my lap yes that makes so much sense yeah, like the universe and the funny thing i've been working on mary knows this i've been working on my book for like at least seven years you had been yeah yeah because i was trying to research it and get you know get it right into all this and and I hadn't planned to open my own comedy school, but right when I opened Dow Comedy Studio, my book, The Dow of Comedy, came out a couple, a few months later. Yeah. Like everything in the universe aligned and mm -hmm. just made you know. makes so much sense. Well, you know what, Bobby? Maybe we'll just wrap right there. We'll just let's do let's plug your book. Oh, what what do you have? Do you have gigs coming up? Yeah, we, plug well, time. For one thing, I want to plug my the, my favorite thing I've ever done in my life, which is my Amazon Prime comedy special, Bobby All yes. the Greatest Hits. Yes, it's uh, it's my favorite jokes from all my four previous albums from like 30 okay. years of comedy. Um, and it's an hour and 45 minutes long. Amazing. Uh, I did. I meant for it to be an hour and a half long. Uh, but yeah, it was it's so it, I'm so proud of it. You know, I invested money in it. So the sound is great and the, the quality of it's great. And, um, and, and edited by Antonio Scarpita. Um, and, uh, and so I'm really proud of that. And I'm doing an audio version of the Dow of comedy. 
Oh, great. Oh my yeah. gosh. That's awesome. We took everything out of our storage room since we're closed, yeah. uh, moved it into the showroom and we, we soundproof the storage room at Dow. So mm-hmm. now I go up there a couple of days a week and read my microphone. I'm mean, read my mic, read my book into a microphone. So there will be an audio version of, uh, of, of the Dow comedy embrace the pause coming oh, up fantastic and we have the dates for the next the seventh annual laugh right girl comedy festival right um <laughs> look at to- suan's shirt bobby look, oh yes look. yay <laughs> I probably don't don't fit into my laugh right <laughs> uh, so june 7th through the 14th Okay. 2021 is, and it may be completely outside. It probably be, oh! be, be. We have two outdoors. I don't, y'all, you haven't been in. To We're in lately. Utah. We're in Utah one of those weekends, but we'll do something. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, in Utah. But the, uh, and we'll probably still have some people zoom in because the last mm-hmm. festival we had people zooming in from six different countries. Oh, cool. Do you like take the iPad up to the front like, so, like that? Then, like we did when you were uh, Skype in from Texas. <laughs> No, what we do is we have a projector and a widescreen. Mm. And so Chris can project the Zoom. That's what we did okay. last, last grad show. Projected the Zoom onto the widescreen. And right. so it's like the audience is big and in front of you. So cool. And you can hear them and they can hear. So you're like, you're performing in there. So, you know, if whoever was performing on Zoom, you'd be projected onto the widescreen. Nice. Well, that's an amazing festival. I, I think I've done almost all of them. I think I missed one. Yeah, we'd love to have you with in person or on Zoom. And we we invested a lot of money into the parking lot and painted it and hung lights and all this stuff. And it's so lovely now. Oh, that's great. It's so beautiful. We put all these plants down there. It's just, it's amazing. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to get my vaccination yeah. so I can leave the house. The Tao of Comedy, Embrace the Pause by Bobby Oliver. And get that book, get the Amazon special, get, we'll be hearing your voice on the book. That sounds also very exciting. And yeah. come to the studio for the women's mics and all the different mics that you're having all the time in classes. So, yay. Thanks Bobby. for coming, Bobby. Thank you so much for Our having queen. me. This was so fun. Thank you. You're this amazing. really fun. I love both of you both very much. Even, even, with, when I'm being petty. That's all right. I'm pettier than, well, we're equally petty. Let's not compete. (laughs) (laughs) I'm pettier than you are. (laughs) I don't know, girl. Thank you. (laughs) All right, Bobby. Bye. Thank you. Comedy cows, two comedy cows. Mary Bacay and Sue on Weaver. Two comedy cows bringing you the good, the bad, and me. Oh, man, that sucks.